Welcome to the Bad Roman Podcast. On this show, we talk with veterans, community leaders, Christians, and non-Christians as we explore the entanglement of Christians with the state. The Bad Roman Project was created out of the firm belief that as Christians, we are called to follow Christ, not the state. Here is your host, Craig Hargis. Hey folks, today we have Carrie Baldwin on the show. She recently wrote an article titled The Virulence of Moral Panic for LibertarianChristians.com. While reading her article, I caught myself nodding in approval all the way through it and reached out to her about telling us more about moral panic. The way she explains what we are seeing regarding the panic caused by the coronavirus is excellent. Before we get into it, why don't you give us a little background of yourself? Sure. Well, I'm an independent researcher, writer, and podcaster. Um, my website is called MereLiberty.com, and my podcast is called Dare to Think. And basically what I do is I challenge paradigms. I uh, my, my writing is geared towards the educated layperson. It's intended to help us really challenge and rethink the way we see the world. And so um, what I tend to do is take topics sometimes that are controversial, but I want to present them from different angles so that we can learn how to uh, more critically think about about what's going on in the world and, and how we can deal with it. And of course, they do that from a perspective of libertarian philosophy and also reformed theology. So that's that's essentially what I do in a nutshell. I love it. So in your article, you, you started off talking about how we got here is the great topic in the media, but why we got here is another question and not one discussed enough. Why we got to this point is through moral panic. You want to give us a definition of moral panic or explain what moral panic actually is? Because I'd never heard this term before, before I'd read the article. Sure. Yeah. Um, and just to be clear, I'm not a trained psychologist. My degree is in philosophy, um, but I really love researching. And so I actually came across this idea um, from an article written by a Dr. Scott A. Bonn uh, from Psychology Today. And he, he defines moral panic this way. He says, moral panic has been defined as a situation in which public fears and state interventions greatly exceed the objective threat posed to society by a particular individual or group who is or are claimed to be responsible for creating the threat in the first place. Now, this isn't Dr. Bond's idea either. Um, he actually, um, and if you, go, if, if you go to the article in the show notes, I cite... Uh, Dr. Bond's paper or article, so you can get a little bit more history on on uh, what moral panic is. But basically, it's a concept from criminal psychology, and it's a tool. Moral panic is a tool that is used by certain groups of people to exploit um, fear or the natural self defense mechanism that we all have uh, in our in our minds, which is fight or flight. And uh, what I noticed from this article and a couple of other articles is that one of our innate fears as human beings has to do with infection and disease. So the psychology of infection is is particularly powerful, and uh, that's what that's what drew me to the to the topic to begin with. When you said that moral panic works to mani- manipulate the people on a mass scale. And I noticed when before the panic of this virus really set in, I noticed uh, libertarians or anarchists trying to get out in front of it, you know, because you could you could see it unfolding and how the state was going to respond to it. And one of the things that you point out in your article is the war on terrorism. So when 9-11 happened, I was all for giving up liberty for safety. I mean, I, I admit that to this day. I know I was wrong now, but I think the same thing is happening now with people that are, are afraid of this virus. They're, they're, they're seeking or they're looking for the state to fix this problem for us when they should be able to re- recognize that the state has no interest in our well-being at all anyway. Mm-hmm. Now, do you see this getting any better or do you think the panic's just going to get worse? I mean, because if people are going to continue to, to watch mainstream media or listen to the government on all this. There's nothing, there's nothing that they're saying that is positive about this. We hear about 
how how bad it's getting. Well, I, I mean, all of this all of this is happening, yes, on a mass scale because you have uh, you have a very large group of people in America and really across the world who rely on certain outlets for their information, which is going to be your government channels, your media channels, that sort of thing. So, you know, the people uh, that I think are either coping well or, you know, seeing this from the angle of a government power grab or even, you know, just the collapse of, of the economy, what what those people are doing is just seeing this from a different angle and being able to say, okay, yes, we can actually take a global pandemic seriously and not sacrifice these other things. In order for for those people who haven't been thinking about these things to actually change their mind, that's, that's sort of a different story. Um, and I think that what it's going to take is, first of all, people like us who, who, who maybe understand this from a different perspective, having some compassion for the fact that these people are actually reacting. Um, they're reacting from a normal psychology. Okay. So this is their fear is a normal reaction to an abnormal situation. And now that doesn't mean that they're acting, uh, rationally, right. They, the, the drive to, um, have the state take care of us isn't necessarily rational, especially in the grand scheme of things when we can see throughout history that uh, crises are usually the point at which um, you know governments go in and take advantage and and up their their power. Uh, you know, in, instead, it's it's a matter of teaching people to see things from a different angle, uh, acknowledging their fear acknowledging that there's a good reason for it, right? There's, we, we have a legitimate fear of, of infection, um, but talking about it and, and reasoning through it. Now, what that means for each individual person, that's, that's an individual thing and who you're able to get through to and who you're not able to get through, through to, that's an individual thing. Um, so how, how long do I see this going on for? Uh, that's really hard to say. I mean, if we look at the the war on terrorism, I mean, how many times did that thing officially end and it's still not ended? <laughs> but at the same time, you have people who have either grown accustomed to their lack of freedom as a result, or it just sort of became a non-issue. It, it's not a forefront sort of topic anymore. And so I imagine that what's going to happen is you know, the, the rates of infection will, will, uh, decrease because we're, we're going to be coming out of cold and flu season and the rates of death will, uh, decrease just because if people aren't getting sick from the virus, they're not having complications from it and not dying from it or as many of them anyways. And then it'll become a non-issue, but the things that will hang around are all of these quote unquote protective measures from from governments who have now, you know, uh, really harmed our economy. I don't know to what extent yet, but really harmed our economy and have, uh, you know, run roughshod over, over our freedoms. So when it's going to end, I, who knows? Yeah. I think that's probably my biggest fear with all this is you saw it with, you know, after nine 11 and, Americans were wanting more and more government to protect us. Mm -hmm. And now 20 years later, we're still in this war on terrorism. So it's like, mm -hmm. it's become a, just a normal everyday activity for in our lives. And that's what worries me the most, you know, as allowing the government to do this, it's going to become a normal part of our lives that we're going to live in fear because of this, because we're afraid of the next virus. You know, people are going to get sick next year too. And it might right. be a new thing. It might be a right. new strand of the coronavirus, or it might be a whole different virus. We're going to experience this every year. And I'm trying with all that I had to just stay level-headed and not get completely frustrated with people. But, you know, just in conversation, I, I talked to a guy at work the other day and he's all 
saying that we have to force people into their homes. You know, they mm -hmm. made us essential employees at work and we're going to work seven days a week. Yeah. They said, so we're going to force us into our homes. How are we going to pay for, put food on the table? You know, I read something yesterday that 10 million people have lost their jobs in two weeks Yeah, since it started. That's yeah. insanity. And they're, they're predicting this to be worse than the Great Depression as far as unemployment rates. Right. Well, and so one of the, there's a couple of ways that, that I've sort of gone about talking about this. And the first thing is, is to talk about what coronavirus actually is. Now, um, before I got into philosophy, uh, my, uh, my previous profession was in medical lab science. I was uh, a medical laboratory technician in the United States Air Force. And um, I absolutely love the job and really appreciate the education that I received from that. Um, and I actually pulled out one of my old, my old study books that I used to, uh, to get my, uh, my MLT certification with. And I looked up the information on virology. So this book was published in 1997. Granted, it doesn't have, you know, new research in it, but it defines what coronaviruses are. And coronavirus is just a reference to the structure of the, of the particular virus. But coronaviruses are the second most common cause of the common cold. And every year that we, that we have cold and flu season, you always hear people say things like, man, that bug going around this year is just really awful. Oh, yeah, we got it this time. And it was just we were sick for weeks. Like we have those conversations every single year. So, you know, I try to put this in perspective. I don't want to, I don't want to simply say, oh, this is just another cold because each, each strain is different. I mean, th the other interesting thing about coronavirus is it's an RNA virus, which just means that it changes more frequently than a DNA virus does. But that's normal. Like we have many different strains of coronaviruses that are out there. And they all cause, or most of them cause, upper respiratory infection. And there are definitely people who are vulnerable to upper respiratory infection and, and should take precautions. But we don't need to shut down the economy just because there's a new strain, because every season there's a new strain. So that's number one. The second thing that I point out to people who think that shutting down the economy is a good idea in response to all of this is to say, okay, how do you suppose that America was able to create the number one healthcare system in the world? We did that through the market. And what is the market? The market isn't, you know, mathematical equations and algorithms and, and uh, profit and loss and, and that sort of thing. Although, you know, that's entailed in it. But what it is, is it's people. It's, you know, the market is you and I. It's, uh, us voluntarily acting towards a mutually beneficial end. And the only reason why it makes sense to stay home uh, when, uh, when there's a pandemic is because we normally stay home when we're sick. And so there's no reason to believe that um, if we were doing something like Sweden or South Korea, that if, if we were particularly vulnerable or we did actually contract the disease that we would stay home. Not, not even necessarily because we want to save everybody else, but because we want to preserve our own health and, and get over it because nobody likes being sick. But the point is, is that we need all the healthy people out there doing their thing, living their lives, participating in the economy, because that's what keeps our healthcare system healthy. And if we ruin the economy, we're going to eventually ruin the very healthcare system that we're going to need to fight this virus, no matter how bad or, um, or not the, the, the virus is. Hey folks, Craig here. And I'd like to let y'all know we are always looking for writers to contribute to our blog. I don't care if you have any experience or not. Two or three of our contributors had no prior experience writing, and it turns out they have a real knack for it. Our project coordinator helps them put the articles together, and she publishes them on our website and Facebook page, and you will also have the option to come on the show and go more in depth about your article. So if you like what we're doing at The Bad Roman and would like to try your hand at writing, then send us an email at thebadromanpodcast at gmail.com. We're having a blast with this project, and we would love for you to join us in helping promote it. Now back to the show. 
so when, when, since all this started, I've, I've I don't can't count on both hands how many times I've been called a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> Let me put my ten full hat on for a second. Do you do you see this? And I don't I don't, I don't the term conspiracy theorist bothers me too because it's just you know questioning the the actions of known liars in my opinion. But do you see this? And I was talking to a guy at work. Do you see this as some sort of social experiment by the government? And if, if so, if it is a social experiment, it is working out perfectly for them for future pandemics or future wars or, or the next thing that people are going to be afraid of. Well, I'm going, I'm going to answer that question this way. Um, way back after 9-11, uh, I started watching Alex Jones. And I had to stop watching Alex Jones because he was way too, too tinfoil hat for me. Mm -hmm. There's, um, there is so much that is outside of our control. That's, it's not probably not worth speculating on. And we can run ourselves into a tizzy, uh, with, with conspiracy theories, which may end up being true, but they're outside of our control. So, uh, you know, do I think that this is a large social experiment? No. Uh, do I think that there are malicious players who are taking advantage of a crisis like, you know, what Rahm Emanuel has openly said? Yes. I do think that there are malicious actors who are taking advantage of the situation. To what degree? I don't know. But at the same time, that's nothing new. There's always been malicious actors who take advantage of, of crisis situations. So, you know, the whole point is that human beings are adaptable. Even the market can can adapt to what's going on. The biggest thing that's in our way, the biggest non-essential business that's in our way is the government. And that's not helping. We can deal with a pandemic. We can deal with the economy if the government steps out of our way. And right now, they're not only in our way, but they are using a heightened um, amount of violence to make that happen. And that's a huge problem. Yeah, at the this has given anarchists and voluntarists a, a, a great opportunity to show how voluntary society could work, mm -hmm. in my opinion. And I, I, the guy I work with, he's a self-proclaimed socialist, and he came. He was coming up to me yesterday. He's talking about uh, handheld respirators that you you know pretty much pump yourself. Mm -hmm. I guess manual. I, I haven't heard anything. But he said, "I'm going to research how to do this, and maybe I could make some and, and sell them." Yeah. And another guy was telling me about his daughter made some masks that has been approved by this place, I guess some doctor's office, that she's going to be selling this to this doctor's office. And the government's not involved in any of this. And I pointed it out to him. I said, what you're talking about is, is a great example of how a voluntary society would work. We can handle all mm -hmm. of this on our own. Yeah. If government is involved with all this, they're just going to make it worse. Right. There's it's been proven time and again. Everything they touch, they screw up. Right. So if I think I think as as voluntary as we could, we should we should be. I don't I don't want to use the word glad that this is happening, but it gives us a real opportunity to show. Yes. How this how we could handle this on our own without government overreach. Yes. Um. Yeah. Yeah. There was there was a story that came out uh, shortly after. Uh, COVID-19 hit America about some company that had started 3D printing ventilators and they were sued. They had to stop making ventilators. And well, now what? Now we're talking about a shortage of ventilators. You know, it's, uh, we had private, um, private medical laboratories saying, hey, we can produce some tests so we can start testing, you know, as soon as possible. And the CDC was like, nope, sorry, you have to go through FDA channels. We can't use that. And at first they were, the, the CDC was saying, don't, don't bother with the masks. They're not going to help. And then a couple days ago or yesterday, they changed their mind and they say, yes, masks will now help. But the, the import of those from China have been halted. So we can't even get a hold of them. So now people are having to make their own. So all of the responses that we're having to do with this is coming from the people anyway. It's just being made harder because the government's in the way. Yep. And what Sweden teaches us and South Korea and uh, Taiwan and Singapore and even Germany, and I don't endorse 
all of the policies that all of those countries have used. But at the very least, they didn't shut down their economies. And what those countries have taught us is that uh, we we don't need to actually kill our economy in order to save lives. Yeah. And what free marketers should be saying, what what libertarians and anarchists should be saying is, um, if the free market had been allowed to work, we would probably already be on top of this thing. Yeah, that's one thing that's funny because when when people tell me that, that people should be forced in their homes, even if they're healthy, I'm thinking, man, the fact that that they think that we need to force people into their homes doesn't make any sense to me. None of everything that's going on right now is, is just boggling my mind. Mm-hmm. I don't think I've ever, I don't know that if you have, but I don't think I've ever seen anything like this in my lifetime, you know, to the, to the, the, the panic point of it. And it, the, the, and it happened so fast. Yeah. You know, it was, it wasn't like a slow progression to the panic that we got. I mean, you, it's all they're talking about on, 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 mainstream media. I try to tune it out. So one of one of the uh, factors in a moral panic is the news media. And they are able to uh, drive the narrative in two, in, in two ways. First of all, you have the framing of the message, and, and that's just how they're presenting it. So it can be anything from uh, just reporting rates of infection, for example, and making making that the thing to be afraid of is the rate of infection. But it's also more subtle things like their, uh, their graphics. Like you'll see, you'll see these graphics with like, you know, a black and white picture and then pasted on the front is this, um, you know, is this big word and big, big bright red letters that says pandemic. Right. And big scary letters, but that, (laughs) yes. It, and when the music too that they're playing behind it too it's like watching a horror flick or something i'm like yeah they they use this very dramatic cinematic music and that invokes emotions uh those all have effects on our brain and they're very subtle but they do have have real effects the the other thing that they do that the media does is uh priming so what priming is is where they actually exploit our normal, our norm, our normal heuristics, our normal ways of, of thinking about the world, and so you know this can be anything from you know triggering that very innate sense that we need to protect ourselves from viruses because that's an age old enemy for human beings, um, and that can be triggered by a number of things like watching Dustin Hoffman's Outbreak or the new movie Contagion or whatever, or with regard to the news there, you know, they can prime you by identifying the folk devils, which are the people who are labeled as the bad guys, but aren't really the bad guys. So in this case, the folk devils are probably people like us who are uh, saying, hey, wait a second, Um, this virus might be a bad thing, but shutting down the economy could be worse. when When I first read your article, and I was reading about when you're talking about folk devils, I was like, man, I'm a folk devil. I think that's probably the first time I've ever been called a devil. And it was mm-hmm. in a good sense and not, <laughs> not used as a bad way. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and they'll, you know, who are other folk devils? Oh, well, those are the people who are going out to the store for, for quote unquote, non-essential reasons. It's like, really, you know, what's going on in that person's head and, and you think that they're out for something non-essential just because you've got all of your essentials at home. Um, We recently had a public address by our governor here in New Mexico. And she says to us, she she says to us, uh, New Mexico is doing a great job in flattening our curve. It's, it's really starting to flatten out and we're really, you know, thank you, New Mexico for, for staying at home and doing all this, this stuff. And then immediately turns around and says, but too many of you, are going out. Too many of you are going to the big box stores. So there's two folk devils there. There's you people who are going out and the big box stores. And she says, and we know that too many of you are going out because we're tracking your mobile data. And she shows this chart of of information about locations and and mobile data. So she's just identified the, the folk devil, which is all you people who are going out who aren't taking this thing seriously. You need to be staying at home and cowering in your corner. Well, when you, 
you just mentioned how they're able to read your, you know, your movements. Mm -hmm. One thing I've noticed from state to state, it almost seems like they're reading from a playbook. I, I live in Tennessee and the governor until just a couple of days ago had kind of just left it to a local level, you know, and he mentioned something about, he said, well, Tennesseans are, have been very good about, you know, staying at home and social distancing. But I have noticed over being able to track their, their traffic, you know, their traffic actions. I'm not, I'm wording it wrong, I'm sure. But, you know, just in every state there, they are violating our, our rights to, you know, just to leaving us alone. They're tracking us. And people are applauding this. That's what's frustrating me the most about all of this is the applause that is coming from Americans right. to the actions of government, the government overreach. And once you start giving freely those those rights away, you will never get those back. They're gone. Mm -hmm. And when you come back to the folk devils and say, why didn't you say something? Man, we were over here screaming at you. We were trying to get your attention. Right. But we were all called crazy, you know, or... They try to shame us into, well, you don't care about my grandmother. How many times have you heard that argument? Oh, yeah. Well, I don't know your grandmother, but I I, I love mine, and I would yeah. never intentionally harm her. Well, you know, when, when people become accustomed to a way of life, and they take for granted certain things, which we all do, then when something disrupts that way of life in such a way that you aren't prepared for, you're looking for somebody to save you. And, you know, we have been primed for this for uh, at least 19 years, probably more since 9-11, you know, primed for this idea that the government needs to save us from the thing that scares us the most, whatever that may be. You know, we, we declare wars on concepts now. We, we declared war on terrorism. We declare war on drugs. We declare war on now a virus. And those, those aren't things that you actually declare war on. I mean, that's, that's a platitude. But, you know, what, what we're experiencing now is the result of um, a lot of patterns over time. And not only that, but a resistance on many to be able to accept and adapt to change, which is ironic because human beings are highly adaptable. Like that's one reason why, um, why we have been able to progress and advance as a species is because we're so adaptable and we have adapted and evolved right alongside, uh, pathogens. So they adapt, we adapt, <laughs> they adapt, we adapt. And that's just, that's the way it's been for millennia or however long, you know, however old you think the earth is and however long you think human beings have been around, that's how long pathogens have been around for. And we've been dealing with this for that long. So this is nothing new in the grand scheme of human history, but it's new in our frame of reference because we have uh, grown accustomed to the healthcare system through the market, being able to handle and and provide when these things happen. But part of the moral panic, part of that moral panic concept is that the media is now talking about it more. They're putting it front and center in your mind's eye. And um, this is called the availability heuristic. Just because there's more information available to you, uh, it makes it seem like the salience of the issue is more pertinent than it actually is. And again, that's not to say that we need to downplay any threat from the virus because it, it could very well be um, a more, viri more virulent and deadly strain than previous viruses. And that's okay. What we would be saying as libertarians and anarchists is who's better equipped to handle that? It's not the government. And the government has proven that because they've blocked tests. They've, they've, um, you know, they've stopped importing masks. They've, they have been in the way each step of the way, whereas the market has been trying to respond and adapt and the market does it pretty, pretty quickly and efficiently. So we could even have a situation if this were a free market where we were voluntarily staying at home and voluntarily working from home where that was possible without other people who don't have that opportunity, 
uh, losing their jobs and, you know, getting bullied and pushed around by, by law enforcement who are just, you know, out there trying to make sure that you're not out there. All right. So in your article, you said to understand how moral panic works, we must understand the kinds of actors involved. Here are the five kinds of human actors in a moral panic. And, you, and we've already talked about folk devils, but there's also rule and law enforcers, the media, politicians, and the public. Mm -hmm. Now, you even talked about how the public are used as law enforcers. You know, like if you see something, say something type mentality. If you see people hanging out together, call the cops and that's happening. That's absurd to me. If you see people having a conversation, I was on my way to work the other day and I saw people out walking their dogs, jogging, riding their bikes, kids flying kites and people in their front yards, not within, not doing this social distancing. They were, within six feet of each other, having a conversation with their neighbor. And I, you know, that makes me smile because to me, it's like, cause I think at some point people are gonna get sick of this and they're going to be like, all right, they're just gonna tell the government to get bent. Yeah. You're not gonna, you're not gonna rule over us like this. You're not gonna, you're not gonna control our lives. Cause we're, I don't think we've been free in this country for a very long time, if ever, but people have that mentality that we're a free country. And once they start realizing and waking up to this, they're not going to, they're not going to stand for it. And I'm afraid of way that's going to end. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want a war, but I'm afraid that if it could get to a point that people are going to start shooting each other over this, you know what I mean? Now I'm, I fully believe that this coronavirus exists. I'm not one of those coronavirus deniers. It's it's people are sick. I understand that. And I'm sad for them. But the, the panic that is spread is to me is far worse than this virus. You know, people have die every year of different things, every day of different things. But the focus on this is, is, is going to make people crazy. They, the, the suicide rate in Tennessee has gone up because they don't know when their next paycheck is coming. To me, that's far worse than this virus. Yeah. Well, and we, we tend to, we tend to not realize the number of factors that go into our own health and well-being. You know, God created us with an immune system and and he did that for a reason because you have these microscopic pathogens that that we can't see, right? And you can't you can't use normal weapons against. So we have this built-in immune system and that immune system has to be trained. So the more that you come in contact with the disease, the stronger that it gets. And, you know, we tend to, to think that the immune system is all about antigens and antibodies and, and, you know, white blood cells and things like that. And that is certainly part of it. But other aspects of our uh, immune function are from mental health. And so if we're going to actually prepare ourselves and be ready to come in contact with a new pathogen, you know, we need to, we need to be in good mental health. We need to, um, be exercising. We need to be outside. We need to, we need to recognize that there's a holistic approach to health and well-being, And it's not simply about, uh, trying to keep from, from being infected by it. In fact, that's probably one of the worst things that could happen. You have Sweden right now who is not shut down. Um, they're going to be, uh, a great case study for figure for for being able to see if what solved our problem in the United States was the shutdown or not was the government intervening. I think we'll be able to compare with Sweden and South Korea and some of the other countries that, that didn't shut down. I mean, I liked sitting at home by myself a lot. To be honest with you, I, I had no problem with that. But when you start making me do it, or if I have if I don't have the option of going outside and getting some sunlight, I'm going to go stir crazy. Mental health is really important. In fact, because you know, a lot of people have talked about various dystopian uh, novels being relevant to today. That one of the most uh, relevant dystopian novels, and actually it's just a novella, it's a very short story, um, is called The Yellow Wallpaper. And it's actually based on a true story of a woman's experience being told that she was too sick to go outside. And this was by her husband, who also happened to be a doctor. And it drove her insane. And the story is about 
how she tried to rationalize her having to stay at home for her own sake because she was too weak and vulnerable. And she went insane. And um, so I I do think that we need to take the psychological uh, aspect very seriously, the mental health aspect very seriously. Um, I think it explains a lot of why we're reacting the way that we're reacting, um, but also where we need to look for solutions because the solutions aren't going to come from those methods that prove to uh, produce insanity in people. I'm no doctor, obviously, but do you think the the way we act, we act in today's society that we've weakened our immune system to a point that we can't fight some of this stuff off? And the reason I say that, because, you know, as a kid, I grew up in West Texas and we drink out of a water hose and where, where we lived, we didn't get a lot of rain, but one year it was, it rained, it rained so much. We were, it was flooding. And me and my brother was out there playing in this. We know that can't be sanitary, mm-hmm. but we didn't die from it, you know, mm-hmm. and we had cow pastures all over the place. And right. where we grew up in Great Creek, Texas, it was not, there was nothing to do. I mean, we didn't even have a high school. So we found things to do. And one of the things that we would do is go to these cow pastures, pick up cow patties and throw them at each other. You know what I mean? Yeah. Now I'm not saying that's, that's what we should be doing to to build our immune (laughs) system, but we didn't die from it. Right. So I don't know to me, to me, it seems like our, our immune system is weaker these days because of the acts. I think I'm all about washing hands. Please wash your hands. Yeah. Please wash your hands when you, especially when you leave the restroom. I can't stand that, especially when I work. When I go to open the door, I carry the paper towel that I've washed my hands with. I carry that paper towel to open the door because I've seen people walk out of that door without washing their hands. Yeah. Well, I I, I wouldn't necessarily say that our immune systems are weaker. I think that probably we have become so accustomed to the things that allow us to um, allow us to be healthy. So these are going to be things, not just the healthcare system, but other things like indoor plumbing and readily available food. And, you know, even, uh, supplemental nutrition, you know, uh, vitamins and and things like that, that you can, that you can get from your, your health food store. I mean, there's, there's a number of things, um, that we do to help our health and well being that support our immune system. Now, there are definitely things that we can do that don't support the immune system. So we have readily available food, but there's also a lot of bad food out there. We have readily available exercise opportunities. So, you know, the gym, running outside, bicycling, uh, home workouts, whatever, whatever it is, but we just choose to not do them. We have the healthcare system, but it has become monopolized by government bureaucracies like the CDC and FDA. Um, so it's certainly not a perfect system. Um, and there's something to be said about allowing us to be exposed to disease in order to produce immune responses. I mean, ostensibly, that's what a vaccine is all about, is uh, introducing a small amount of of that pathogen into your body in order to elicit an immune response um, and hopefully build up some antibodies so that you can have an immunity to it. So, uh, you know, drinking from a garden hose and, you know, playing with, with cow patties or in the dirt, those, those can, those can (laughs) have immune building uh, opportunities. Now, the other side of that is, is that we have, um, they used to call them super bugs. I'm actually kind of glad that that this uh, moral panic sort of fell out of the media, which was the idea of super bugs. But we ha- so there's there's a strain of Staph aureus, which is normally just uh, what we call normal flora on on the skin. Um, but there's a strain called MRSA, methicillin resistant Staph aureus, which was created because of the uh, the hyper sterilized environments in the hospital. So hyper sterilization isn't good. I mean having some degree of, of, of cleanliness, right? So we have the indoor plumbing, we have clean food and water, and we do have clean healthcare environments. Those things are all good, but being, uh, really, uh, 
almost OCD about it and, and hyper sterilizing, that has a negative effect too. So at any rate, all of that to say is I don't think that our immune systems are nece- necessarily weakened. I know that there are some people who, who think that, um, you know, uh, things like 5G are, are a problem. And I don't, I don't know about that. I haven't actually looked into it. But there are things that weaken our immune system always. And then there are things that, that strengthen and build our immune system. And that is, that is something that is constantly going on without us even realizing it. Yeah, I agree completely. Well, folks, that's the kind of level headness we need from people like Carrie. I really appreciate you coming on. Won't you uh, plug your plug your stuff, and then I'll let you get back to your your day. Sure, you can find all of my stuff on MirrorLiberty.com. I'm also a, a contributor at the Libertarian Christian Institute. Um, I do do this for a living, so if you want to support what I do, you can go to MirrorLiberty.com/slash/membership. It's a Patreon style. Uh, sort of membership uh, with memberships starting as low as $4 a month or one-time donations. I also take through my secured site. So if you want to support me, I'd greatly appreciate it, but you can find all of my stuff there. I have the podcast there, my articles and, and everything's there. Also, you can sign up for my free newsletter, which is just a monthly, usually article, unpublished article that that um, I send out to my newsletter readers. And my newsletter readers have the great benefit of being able to respond to those and i will respond uh back to my readers when when they ask me questions awesome i hope we can do this again sometime gary sure thanks for having me on craig yes ma'am have a good day thanks you too thanks for joining us this week on the bad roman podcast you can subscribe to the show wherever podcasts are found And if you like what you hear, be sure to leave us a rating, as it is the best way to help other people find us. 100% of donations to the show are given to local charities in Memphis, Tennessee. To learn more about this week's guest and how you can support the show, please visit thebadroman.com.